Once again, good morning. Welcome here to Central Baptist Church, whether you're in person, whether you're engaging with us through Facebook, live streaming television, back in the Family Life Center. If you're here today uh, for the first time, if I met you, my name is Archie Mason. I'm the senior pastor. So glad that you're here. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're teaching through uh, the book of Ephesians. And so today, we're going to start uh, in verse 15. Hey, remember, if you missed it earlier, some of you may have just joined us live stream. If you're a member of Central, you have an opportunity to vote uh, for Corey. That comes as a recommendation from our personnel team, from the staff, from the deacons, and it's to us as a church. And so anytime during the service day until about 1230 today, you have an opportunity to vote uh, online. Uh, a lot of you know my story. I've been here a long time, so uh, I share a lot about myself because I think I know more about myself probably than, than maybe others or I know about anybody else. But uh, my dad is approaching right at 90 years of age, but he has a younger brother. Uh, and Uncle Bill came along kind of later in life for my grandpa Harry and my grandma Goldie. But Uncle Bill is what is known as the cool uncle. Now, especially when I was uh, younger, Uncle Bill, uh, he would, you know, I was growing up as a kid. I spent a lot of time with my grandpa. Well, he was off at school. He had different jobs that he was a part of. He drove some cool cars. I remember he had a telephone in his car one time. That was so cool early on. I didn't know you could do that, uh, that kind of stuff. But he was great at buying Christmas gifts for somebody like me and my sister. He always had the type of job that he usually worked on Christmas Eve. He's a night person, stays up at night. And it doesn't function that well early in the morning. So he would do what a lot of uh, folks do do is he would buy his Christmas gifts on Christmas Eve after he got off work. And so sometimes he lived in Little Rock. He would not get back home to Bisco till like three or four uh, in the morning. And so, you know, uh, for us, Christmas kind of start kind of early at my house and we bit my mom and dad's. And so we'd get up, we'd have breakfast. And usually my grandpa Harry, grandma uh, Goldie would come down and we'd always ask, where's Bill? She said, well, he's getting around, he's breathing, he'll be here uh, in a little bit. And so we'd be opening gifts and Uncle Bill would come in to the house. He may have a sack and it may be something like it. Hey, look, I'm sorry I couldn't wrap it, but here it is, you know, and hit cool gift. Like I remember one time he bought this big, humongous racetrack. I mean, he comes in with his racetrack. I'm like seven years old. I think on the box it had 14 years of age and up, you know, I mean, speed cars, everything could imagine. Uh, We put it together. Uh, One year, I believe he brought me a chemistry set. I think I was like nine. I mean, I was setting stuff on fire in the backyard. I mean, this is the kind of guy that he was. He's always cool. I love you. See you. You know, and I'm see him like six months later or something. So it's just his job and what he did. But he was also a guy who had some of the coolest pets. But also, he was the kind of guy to get a cool pet and go, hey, uh, talking to my grandma, go to, hey, mama, uh, I'm, I'm moving to a new apartment. Can you keep this pet? And so they would end up with stuff. In fact, he had a python snake. The kind that squeezes you, the constrictor kind of kind. And so I remember as a kid, I'd go down to my grandma's, they'd have a big aquarium, and I would sit on the glass and I'd look at this snake. And I'd think, is he going to stick his tongue out? Is his eye looking at me? I'd tell my grandpa, I said, I think the snake is dead. He said, snake's not dead. He's just laying there. I said, well, he doesn't move. He said, that's okay. He said, you know, we're going to feed him a mouse or something this afternoon. Or, you know, whenever it was feeding time, I, I would go as a kid and I would watch that. But I can remember the first time the phone call came. It was probably about seven o'clock at night, and my grandma, I could hear her on the other side. My dad answers the phone, and my grandma goes, Harry Jr., yes, ma'am, you need to come down to the house right now. Okay, mama, why? Because they just live right down there. Why? Bill Snake is not in the aquarium. Now, I've shared this with you before. My family, the Mason family, has what we call the the hoarding gene, okay? You know what I mean by that? We accumulate stuff over time. Uh, You know what? You may come want to borrow something. We got it. We don't know where it is, but I'm sure we have it somewhere, okay? Well, when you, when when a a python constrictor. So I remember my grandma saying, Harry Jr., I'm not getting in my bed till y'all find that snake. That bed's, that, that snake's going to get in the bed with me and squeeze me tonight or something. And so, I mean, it was all out, tear the house apart. I mean, and so as a kid, I'd be down there. I mean, I'd pull a box back, uh, a chair. I'd look under the bed. I, you know, I was kind of scared to death. And we would always, this happened like three or four times, we'd always find that snake. He'd end up around anything that's warm in the house, like the hot water heater. He would wrap around that thing. That's kind of wild, ain't it? Okay. Well, what happened with that? You know, that started early. I do not like snakes. 
I mean, I, I, it's not that I'm afraid. It's that I respect him. I know my daddy told me one time, Archie, there's good snakes and bad snakes. I'm like, man, I don't know about good snakes, this kind of stuff. I mean, I grew up, there's a cotton mouth under every levee gate that you flip over. You know, I grew up in the bottoms. If you had a bunch of smart weeds in the field, these are the kind of snakes that get up on top of the smart weeds that'll kind of come after you uh, a little bit, you know, kind of stuff. And so what that has done to me all my life, I pay attention to what I'm doing in regard to snakes all the time. You know, even, uh, especially in, during turkey season, especially during the year, you know, I'm out in the woods, I'm walking and looking wherever I am going. You know, and it's not only in the spring and in the summer, it's in the winter. I was in a duck blind on the Cache River, right below Cache, not too far from here, uh, about December the 15th or whatever, something middle of December. There's four of us sitting in a duck pit, there's water up about right here, and we're sitting there, and the guy beside me, you know, no ducks are flying, so we're eating, drinking coffee, and just kind of shooting and breathing. The guy says, I think there's a snake in this pit. I said, it's the middle of December. These things can't do well in that. Uh, he said, no, there's a snake down in the water. I said, no, there's not. He says, I feel it with my boot. Now, you got to remember, I'm sitting right by him. I said, you're lying. And I, I kind of got this little bit of a phobia, you know. And I said, you're lying. He said, no. He said, I got it. I got it. And so anybody knows duck hunting, he's sliding his boot up the side of the pit. And he pops a boot out of the water. And there's a cotton mouth on his boot in December. Now, needless to say, that duck hunt was over with for me. Come on, right? Hey, I got up on the, it has a bench. I got up on the bench. I'm like, that's it. I can't take this. Now, you say, well, what does that have to do with what you're preaching? Well, absolutely nothing in a way, okay? But. But we're going to look at a text today that spiritually the Lord says, he says, be careful how you walk. Be careful where you go. Pay attention. Be alert. He says, make the most of your time because the days are evil. See, we're going to talk about that, how to walk in wisdom, how you do that. You make the most of your time, but you got to be careful. You got to pay attention. How else do we walk in wisdom? We understand the will of the Lord. How else do we do that? We're filled with the Spirit. That's the text today that we're going to look at. Would you stand with me for the uh, public reading of Scripture as we're in Ephesians 5? We'll pick up here in verse 15. Follow along as I read. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. That means reckless living. But be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody, which means to pluck the strings, okay? Making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, allowing us to come together today. I pray we do not take this day for granted. I know I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, but Lord, I pray, just as we've been singing, just as Corey's been, he's been encouraging us and leading us in this to engage and give praise to you and exaltation uh, to you, Lord, this morning. We lift you up because, Lord, you died on that cross and shed your blood for us, and you were raised from the dead on the third day. Thank for allowing us to come together as a church family. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us today. I, I pray, Holy Spirit, you give us illumination of this passage, uh, Lord, that we would make the most. Uh, of the time that you have allotted us in life and given us. And Lord, I pray today, most importantly, as always, I pray you save somebody today, whether they're here in person, whether they're engaging and watching uh, there online, I pray that you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thanks for standing for the uh, public reading uh, of Scripture. When Paul writing to the church of Ephesus, I've shared this before. There's kind of a transition in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. It's all God's Word. It's all inspired. It's relevant to us today. It's God's revelation to us. But what we see basically in 4 and 5, we see a transition. There's a lot of what I call the practicality of uh, how to live out uh, being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's kind of where we are today. He says, therefore, so when you see the therefore, what's it there for? Look back up. If you weren't here last week, go back. You can watch the message. You can get it uh, there at centralbaptist.com. We've got a podcast. Uh, kind of catch that. So we, we talked about what it meant to be the children of light, to have the fruit of the Spirit, and, and what that means. We work through that passage. So he's saying, therefore, since you understand being a child of light, since you understand the, the verses right before it, that invitation that we see uh, right there in the verses before verse 15, which was probably uh, sang in a, a hymn at Easter as an invitation uh, for unbelievers to receive Christ. He says, therefore, and then we see, he says, be careful how you walk. Not as the 
unwise person, but as a wise person, making the most of your time because the days are, be careful. So he says, pay attention, be alert. That's what we are to do as uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, the enemy is out there. There is in our nation. There's always been, we'll talk about this in a moment, but there is a a great darkness that's in our nation uh, today. There's a great darkness uh, around the world. I used to say that there was the, the spirit a demonic spirit that really uh, hovered, in my opinion, over uh, places like India and where there was uh, people were bound up uh, in sin. They were bound up in the, the worship of uh, animals and, and different stuff like that. You know, you say there was these uh, probably demonic strongholds in various places around the world, but it, it appears to be in the U.S. There's what I call just a, a great darkness. I, I don't know if you could call it the demonic stronghold of selfishness. It's, it's out there. People seem to be uh, all about uh, themselves. And even as believers, if you let it, it will uh, come upon you where it's just all about you and what you want and what you desire and immediate uh, gratification. You don't care about your fellow man or, or, you know, you don't honor what other people say or respect uh, other people. So I, this is just great darkness. So we have to be careful. You got to be careful what you hear. You got to be careful what you watch. You have to be careful where you go. You got to be alert because the enemy is a roaring uh, lion who is out there. So he says, therefore, he says, be careful how you walk. And again, as you're writing them, there's all types of temple prostitution taking place at this time. There's great immorality, great wickedness, sexual immorality, all the stuff that we see in our world today existed at this time. So he says, be careful at this. He said, don't, don't be like an unwise man. Now, here in Northeast Arkansas, uh, I don't know, I'm a, the majority of you are from Northeast Arkansas, and I grew up in Central Arkansas, but here's one thing I've learned about Crowley's Ridge, and it'd be the same way at home. There is no way during the springtime and the summer that I'm going to walk up and down Crowley's Ridge barefoot out in the woods. I am just not going to do that, okay? Then you may say, man, in the old days, uh, that's what people did. Well, look, they had like leather feet in the old days, okay? I don't have leather feet, all right? I want shoes on. But I, I tell you what, you get you a good case of chiggers up on this ridge, hey, you'll be calling grandma, hey, I got chiggers, I'm about to die. She may tell you put Clorox in your water, uh, paint them with nail polish. I don't, you will try every folk remedy grandma has that you know of to get rid of. It's like getting sprayed by a skunk. You'll do whatever. Well, we won't even go there, okay? But you do whatever you need to to get that smell off it. But it's really unwise. Snakes, chiggers, ticks. I mean, that'd be like foolish to do that. So he says, man, don't be foolish, but have wisdom in today and how you walk. And he says this. He says, making the most of your time. Do you realize that we have, you and I, all of us, we have a certain amount of days that have been allotted to us. You're sitting here, there, up there, here, there, everywhere. There's a certain amount of days. The clock is ticking. You have a certain amount of days on this earth, whether you like it or not. It's the way it is. The Bible talks about this. Point unto man wants to die, then comes a judgment. You know, on this. We're to make the most of the time that we have on this earth. Amen? And make the most of it for the glory of God. Because we got a certain amount of time. You know what? Time, it's not neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. I want you to just think about it for a moment. And this will be a little self-reflection, but how have you wasted time in this past week? How have you wasted time? Now, look, God has given us pleasures on this earth. He has. I, I'm going to speak about one pleasure that I really like, fishing. I love to fish, okay? It is a great pleasure. In fact, it's biblical. Come on, amen? Fishing's biblical. Uh, I love fishing. I was talking with a friend the other day. He said, man, I'm ready to go crappie fishing. We got fired up. We started talking about that, and then we started talking about bass fishing. We talk, started talking about cranking, using crankbaits on the rocks, rocks on the White River. We started talking about worming. That means fishing with plastic worms, you know? We, all of you have different pleasures in that, but what can happen is fishing is a pleasure that God has given us, but it can become our God, in which we devote all of our time to that, which is not going to count for eternity. I mean, there's some great pleasures God has given us to enjoy, but it can become an idol and become our God. How have you maybe wasted time uh, in this past week, not uh, using the time that God has given you? All of us in this room can probably say, for us who are older, that yesterday we were 10 years old. Yesterday, my Uncle Bill brought in that racetrack set. I mean, he brought this flying helicopter one time. I mean, it was the coolest stuff. Like, it was yesterday. I remember it vividly, and here I am today with my grandsons were here uh, in the last service. I'm a, a grandpa. I mean, it went from boom, you know, seven years of age, to so here I am in my 50s. I mean, time goes by quick. And the, the Lord tells us, He says, you got to make the, you got to make the most of that time that has been allotted to. So there's a lot of different ways we can go, but here's one thing I want us to think about this morning. 
whether you're here or whether you're engaging online, there are a lot of folks engaging online. They take care of elderly parents. They uh, have underlying health issues. You can't be here. Okay, I, I get it. I understand it. COVID's, you know, we face a lot of sickness, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain uh, in this previous year. But whether you're engaging online or whether you're here, this is the Lord's day. Do you hear me? This is the day the New Testament talks about. They came together on the Lord's Day. This is the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. Can you have a worship service any day of the week? Yes. Uh, you can do that. You can praise the Lord all the time. You can pray anytime. You can study Scripture anytime. But the Lord's Day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, this is the day that the church has always come uh, together uh, since basically that day of Pentecost. And we come together to worship. Do you realize that when you come today, it's not to watch a show? When you came today, it's not to watch a performance. When you came today, it's not to necessarily look around, watch other people to see what they're doing. We have come together today as a Lord's church to worship Him and Him alone. We have come together today to lift up, the high, lift up high the name of Jesus. We have come together today to preach and proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You realize that the writer of Hebrews tells us, he says, he says, we come together as a church, basically, Hebrews 10, to stimulate one another to good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, and the habit of some is, as I see the day approaching, but we're to come together. Why? Because we encourage one another. When Corey backed away from the microphone just a, a few minutes ago, okay, again, I've known Corey all of his life. His dad and I are good friends. His dad's leading worship at Wynn Baptist this morning. Uh, couldn't find anybody to take his place, and so he couldn't be here. So my friend Jeff. Uh, I was looking forward to, to being with him when Corey backed away and he said something like, come on church, let's sing. Let me tell you how encouraged I was to hear the voices of you as we, that encouraged me, that strengthened me, that, that, you know, it wasn't like fire me up to preach. It's just as a believer to know, look, we're in this together. Amen. We are the, the Lord's church. We have come together to seek after him, to praise his name. Hey, to, to really for the Holy Spirit to, to, if we can say this, to kind of fuel us up for what's coming this week. Do you realize that you and I are going to face a lot of challenges? challenges this week. There are things that are, that are already known by the Lord that are coming our way that you and I have no idea about. And you know, that's what we do as the church. Are you making the most of your time? For example, one little iota, one little uh, instance here. Are you making the most of your time in corporate worship? Or are you wasting it? Because here's what's about to happen. A few minutes, we'll give an, an invitation. Do you realize that once this time of corporate worship is gone, you'll never get it back? It's gone. You say, well, I'll be back next Sunday. Let me tell you how this works. You're not guaranteed of that whatsoever. You know, I used to say, some of you here today won't be here this time next year. Through the hurt and pain that we've experienced in church family, I can almost say there's some of you here right now that may not be here this time next month. That's when the Lord says, make the most of your time. And I, I'm just using the idea of worship. You know, time is not neutral. It can be used for good or evil. He said, because the days are evil. Let me give you something here real quick, hypothetically. Uh, five years from now, let's use that. Let's throw it hypothetical. And it's not because of uh, political leadership or whatever, okay? It's because this world's coming to an end. Uh, there's a climax coming to the history of mankind. The, the Lord is going to bring it about. He's going to come back and get his church. And, you know, he's going to renew everything in the end. I know that. Tribulation is coming one day. But let's say hypothetically five years from now, the government comes out and goes, hey, you know what? Central Baptist Church is an enemy of the state. We don't really like what you say. We don't like you talking about abortion and how the Bible says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb and, and songs. We don't like that. And we don't like you telling people that they have to repent of sin because it offends people. So guess what? We're going to shut the doors of Central Baptist Church. Now you say, well, that would never happen. Well, let me tell you something. That's happened around the world all the time. I mean, there's places in China in the underground church. You know what? They may come out and say they got a state church, and by the way, you're going to say this, here's a book of what you can preach and don't say anything else. Hypothetically, what if I have, well, I say that because guess what? This Sunday is going to be gone <laughs> in a few more hours, and you'll never get it back. Just trying to make the point, are you making the most of your time? Because the days, the days are evil that are out there. And it's not just today, it has always been. And we see that even in the book of Timothy where Paul says, in the last days, difficult times will come. 
You see, we got to walk in wisdom. How we do it? Make the most of our time, but we got to be careful in our walk because the days are evil. Here's the second principle we see. You got to understand the will of the Lord. He says, understand. So make the most of your time. The days are evil. Understand the will of the Lord. And sometimes people go, man, I, what is God's will? Let me just share with you some very basics, okay? Very basics is the Lord uh, tells us that he wants us to love him as believers with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen? This means Amen. I'm breathing. Y'all stay with me. We're almost done, okay? Uh, we'll love you with heart, mind, soul, and strength. When we pray in the invitation in the moment, if your heart is not, let's just say this, red heart for the Lord. Now, I don't mean that, hey, I don't mean you got to get up, run, run around, do anything like that. What I'm saying is if your heart, you don't have that passion like you had when you first got saved, the invitation for you would be say, Lord, restore my passion for you. Lord, restore for me the love for you with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. You know it's God's will for us to love neighbor as yourself. Uh, you say, well, they're just unlovable. He didn't ask if they're unlovable. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. To respect other people, do that. Hey, do we stand on the gospel? Yes. We tell people got to repent. Yes. You can't be saved unless you repent. But we're to love people. You know, he tells us that. We could go, the, his will is the great commission. He tells us to go and make disciples. His will. He tells us in scripture, we're to pray for our leaders. Here's what that means. President-elect Biden and the vice president and the new cabinet. If, if Bernie's a part of it or whatever, you know, Mr. Bernie, I want to be respectful to him. And if you say, well, hey, I, I, don't, I don't care for anybody. He didn't ask you if you care for anybody. He said, pray for those who are in authority. That's what he said. He said that we may have a tranquil, a tranquil, I can't get the word out, a peaceful existence. That's what he tells us. It's his will. And then he goes on that he desires for men to be saved. Hey, and to come to knowledge of the Lord God Almighty. And he tells us also that, man, he wants people to repent. He's not desiring that any should perish, but that they would come to repent. This is the, this is the Lord's will that he has. We are to understand. His will is not necessarily like hidden. Uh, he's not hiding behind a tree out there. There's, there's so much of his will that we know. He says, understand the will of the Lord. His will is that we don't waste our time. His will is that we make the most of Sundays in corporate worship. His will is that we pray uh, for one another. I'm going to tell you how you make the most of your time. You, you may say, well, I can't go this, and I, I can't do this, or I can't go there, but you can pray. Man, I want to encourage you in the morning. Why don't we just take this little challenge, okay? And I, I'm preaching on prayer, teaching on prayer on Wednesday nights, okay? Why don't you take the challenge and get up a little bit in the morning. You say, I'm not a morning person. Well, whatever you do at night, you know, get alone by yourself, man. Get into work. Take that passage we put up in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 13 and 14 and pray that back to the Lord in the morning. I would encourage you to do I'd encourage you to make the most of your time uh, in the morning and take that passage. Get up early because prayer moves God. You see, understand what His will is. He desires for us to pray. That's just one. I mean, we could keep going and going and going. Well, here's the last principle we see. We're to be filled with the Spirit. He says, don't be drunk with wine, okay? But he says, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. That's dissipation. Again, that's reckless living. It's, it's to be intoxicated. You could say this, okay? Let me speak to everybody. You can say this. Don't be stoned. Don't be high. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. He says, don't be influenced, because when you're the influence of this stuff, it leads to reckless living. I have a lot of conversations about alcohol. A lot of y'all know my history. I was pretty well raised behind the uh, counter of a liquor store. I know you can't really do that now, but, you know, back then, I guess you could. It's kind of how I grew up. And so sometimes I have conversations with people about alcohol, and I ask them, I said, have you ever drank? And they go, no, but, you know, here's my opinion. I said, well, I understand, and you don't have to... To be a doctor, you don't have to break every bone in your body. So to know about alcohol, you don't have to consume it. But I'm just going to tell you, you're probably talking about something that you don't know a whole lot about that I do because I done been to the darkness and back again. And I can tell you, it has an influence. It has an effect. And it can lead to a whole bunch of stuff in life. It's no good. It's like my mama said, there ain't nothing going on after midnight you need to be involved in. You know, stuff like that. And so he says, man, don't be under the influence of this stuff. It leads to reckless living. But be filled with the Spirit of God because it leads to joyful living. We talked about last week, the fruit of the Spirit, patience, joy, peace. You know, we, we talked about those things, that long suffering uh, in this. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And so it's not that, well, I wish I had that. No, if you're a believer in the Lord, if you're not operating in the fruit of the Spirit, it's your own fault because we're sealed by the Spirit of God. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible tells us that after listening and after hearing the gospel, okay, and we responded to the truth, we were sealed by the Spirit of God. It's, it's like supernaturally, if you're a believer, you have a big stamp of Jesus on your forehead. I mean, you are sealed. It's, he, the Holy Spirit is a pledge, a guarantee, a promise that we belong to the Lord God Almighty. So he says, don't be drunk with wine, be 
filled with the Spirit, okay? Because being drunk is dissipation, reckless living. Be filled with the Spirit. And then he says this. He says, and speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Three results, okay? Three results of being filled with the Spirit. Singing, thankfulness, and submission to one another as believers. Singing. Now, I love to sing, and I get off key, uh, I mess up, I don't know what service it was, it's three or four Sundays ago, I got fired up, got to singing, started singing, Nathan wasn't singing, it was really bad, okay, and then I want people to get saved, and it got really bad, I mean, you know what, but I love singing, guess what, singing's not a spiritual gift, you say, yeah, we know you ain't got it, I get it, okay, it's not a spiritual gift. All of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're filled with the Spirit, which means to be yielded to the Spirit, we get saved. We have all the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. But what happens is you can grieve the Spirit of God. You know, you as a believer can let junk in your life and you're not allowing yourself to be influenced and living according to the Spirit because the Bible tells us in Galatians, it says walk by the Spirit. You won't carry out the desires of the flesh. And so every day we've got to be yielded uh, to the Spirit. You know, my prayer today is that the Lord would anoint these services with his spirit. You know, I shared this early in our staff meeting this morning. I don't, I don't know if I said this yet or not. I said, you know, as I, I probably did say it, but you know, whenever we have a congressional vote, it makes me nervous. It just does. If you've never been through that before where people don't know you, you don't know them, and I'm up here preaching away, and then you're going to cast a vote really whether you think this is God's will or not. It's just a nerve-wracking experience. It, it is for me when we bring staff on board. It's kind of nervous, but I told our team, I said, you know, to be honest, it makes me nervous, but here's what I know. Regardless of all that stuff and what we're doing as congregationalists and this voting thing that we got going on, I said, we are here today to worship the Lord God Almighty. And I really don't care what else happens. It's that we worship Him. We exalt Him. We lift Him up because when we do that, when we sing about Jesus, it's a supernatural, super powerful thing that the Spirit of God does. There are unbelievers in our midst today. There are unbelievers watching the Spirit of God moves. We're singing. We are exalting the Lord Jesus up. We're talking about His resurrection uh, from the dead. We're talking about He's the King of kings and, and Lord of lords, and the Spirit pierces the heart of someone who's lost and opens their heart to the Lord. And basically, as 1 Corinthians 14 says, they fall on their face before God and say, God is in this place. You see, it's natural when we have the joy of the Lord, we're filled with the Spirit, to sing. And songs of testimony, songs of praise, the Old Testament songs. A lot of the New Testament that we read and I preach through were in fact sung as songs in the early church. And so singing is a result of being filled with the Spirit. Do not miss the opportunity to praise the Lord corporately and singing when we come together because when this day is gone, it's gone. And you will never get it back again. You got to make the most of your time. He says, thankfulness. Man, we have breath in our lungs today because of the Lord. Amen. You woke up this morning because of the Lord God Almighty. He tells us he holds us in his hand. Our days are numbered. You and I don't know. Mine, I'm looking at Jacob. My day most likely could come a lot quicker than his. You know, I'm a lot older than he is. I got my days numbered on this earth. I'm grateful. You know, I was reading... I know I'm ADD, so I just went to another path. I better hold my hand so I can come back to it, okay? So I'm grateful. I was reading in Psalms the other day, and I don't remember which one it was. And David mentioned it was CSV version. And David said, if you give me 70 years or 80 years, he says, I'm going to praise you. And he said this. He said, life is like, okay, and you'll see this in other parts. Life is like a blade of grass that comes out of the ground in the morning that also flowers and yields seed. But in the afternoon, the sun comes, the blade of grass withers and dies. That's your life and my life. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. We're just a vapor. I am grateful that God has given me the here and now. I'm grateful to be here right now. I'm grateful that we can sing. I'm grateful that we can pray. You know, but he also says, too, a result of this is to be submissive to one another, to to yield to one another, serve uh, one another. And I want to tell you, I I do believe, again, there's a great darkness that's out there, and it is that selfishness. And if you allow the enemy, even as a believer, he'll try to weave that selfishness into your life, that it's all about you. It's all about your opinion. It's all about your immediate gratification. You don't care about anybody else. You want your needs met. You want them met now. Listen to me. The Lord says we're to be submissive. We're to surrender to one another. That's a part of the church. We're to help one another. Look, there's some of us in here. Man, we're hurting, okay? We're hurting, and there's some of you who are hurting. 
that we're not going to know you're hurting till you tell us you're hurting. And then we come along and we submit and we yield to one another and we help each other walk through these things in life. Look, a lot of us have stood at gravesides this past year. We have, we have wept over friends and family members. We got folks in a hospital. We got, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. And you turn on the news at night and it'll like make you sick what's going on and taking place across our nation and that. But you got to realize that, man, we got to come together. We got to love folks. We got to encourage people. And as God's people, we got to pray. Amen. We got to pray. So here's the invitation. All right. I know I've said a lot. We could say a whole lot more, but we're, we're landing the plane as it's called in the preacher life. Here's the invitation. There are some here and some watching as a believer, man, you, God has spoken to you. You've been wasting time in your life. You know what? You've been wasting time. You've not been making the most of it. You've been spending time. You've got off into other stuff over there. And it's not that it's bad, but it's just, you've just been wasting time. Okay. You're in a business. You're working hard. The Bible has a lot to say about hard work. You're working for your employer. You're giving 100%. God bless you. Hallelujah. Make the most of your time that you have in that job where the Lord has you. Some of you are here and you're entrepreneurs. You have a business that you run and you own and, and you're providing uh, checks and paying other people to work for you and providing for their families and you love them. And I encourage you, make the most of your time. That's what God has called you to do and be that good business person and give 110% and take care of folks. Make the most of the time that the Lord has given. Be an example of the Lord God in your life. But here's what I also know. There is someone here and someone who's watching, you're believing the Lord Jesus. And you know what? The Lord has told you, you're wasting your time. I got something else that I want you to do. Now, here's what that means. If you're an adult, okay, it may mean selling your house. You said, oh, preacher, why do you have to bring that up? It may mean selling your house. It may mean if you're a business person, selling your business. And God's the one that's very clear on those types of callings. And he's saying, you know what? You've been doing well. I got something else for you. I'm calling you into full-time vocational ministry. When I went to seminary, the average age was 34 years old. We had an African-American friend of mine, business guy. He was older than 34. I think he's like, for his name was Houston. We'd always go, Houston, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. He was the guy with great wisdom in the class. I had a veterinarian friend. He was a vet. He gave up his business. Had a house contractor built houses, gave up his business, went to the mission field. God called him, told him what to do. He said, you're wasting your time. What you're doing is good, but I have something else for you. I want to make the most of it. That could be your calling. The invitation is a place to respond at. You said, Lord, that's deep. That's what God does. So there's some here like that. There's some here today. You lost your joy of your salvation. I say it all the time. You need to pray, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. You know, it's not that God's calling you to go be a missionary. God's calling you as a guy to be a pastor or something like that. But it's that you say, Lord, I've been wasting my time, and so I want to make the most of it. Lord, restore me. I, I pray, Lord, I want to sing loud. I want to sing off key. <laughs> I want to give you glory when I sing off key. I want to praise you, Lord. So that's the invitation. There's some here, you know, you're, you're saved, you're born again, but you haven't been baptized by immersion. And you know, it's, you, you got to take that step, that next step there of obedience. But then also too, here's what I know, because I was just like some of you and some of those watching. You're not born again. You know about Jesus here. You don't know him here. But the Spirit of God has cut through all this junk out here. And the light has borne to your soul. And the light has exposed your sinfulness. And the light has exposed your separation from Jesus. Now, here's a good thing. You haven't run off yet. You're standing in the light. And the Lord is saying, you're weary and heavy laden. You come unto me, I'll give you rest. That's what the Lord's saying to you. And so you come to him in repentance. You say, Lord Jesus, you're right, I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I turn away from my sin. And Lord, I surrender myself to you. Lord, save me today. Now guess what? The God man, the one who rose from the dead on the third day, his name is Jesus, the one and only son of the living God, all eternal, always existed, coexistent, preexistent, has always been. He says, you come to me, I'll save you. He says, you come to me, I'll clothe you in righteousness. You come to me in repentance and faith, I will wipe all your sins away and I'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. What a great promise. That's the invitation to some here today. There's gonna to be pastors here. They're gonna have a mask on. God is speaking to you and the invitation of the Lord is saying, he's saying, you come. 
Maybe you just want to come and pray. Pray for our nation. Maybe you want to come and you want one of the pastors to pray for you. Maybe there's a situation, but however, because the spirit is clear. The enemy, confusion. The spirit, clarity. I'd say you know exactly how you need to respond and what you need to do. I'd just say this to you as your pastor, as your shepherd. Be obedient to what God is saying today. I'm going to pray, then we're going to stand. Father, thank you for today. Lord, you tell us to come to you with thankfulness. You put breath in our lungs. You woke us up. And Lord, we're about to have the invitation. It is the uh, one of the most meaningful parts of the service. We come together. You, you are inviting people to follow you, inviting people to know you, Lord. And so I pray, have your way here. Move and work. I pray we will respond appropriately. I pray we'll respond in the right way. And may you be glorified and honored. Lord, may we be people of praise. May we be people of prayer. Lord, may we be people called by your name. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name, in the name of Christ. Amen. Could we stand, please?